It's been a fiery, hot church service today so far. It is amazing. And uh, I can tell, of course, you know, from last week's lesson that God is a consuming fire. And that's the kind of worship he desires, a fiery church worship service. Amen. Uh, you know, uh, first of all, I, I do got to thank everyone who's, in a sense, come up here and has already, you know, uh, served. You know, I think about the amazing, lovely, you know, uh, twin sisters. Not twin sisters, but, you know, Ebony and Ivory right there. You know, Claire and Carmen on the announcements. You know, thank you so much for that. Such a great duo. And, of course, what can we say about our GQ model, guys? You know, Marcos Garcia, man. That, you know, that I, I, was, I was in my chair, I was crying, guys, okay? Um, that was a really powerful communion speech, guys. Uh, if you need faith today uh, and evidence of, you know, God working people's lives, just go speak to Marcus. What he shared was just a quarter of his life. I'm being serious, a quarter. You know, you can speak to him and learn, just, just get to know everything else that, in, in a sense, that God has saved him and redeemed him from. You know, knowing that, hey, he had a sexual confusion right there, sexually identity confusion. But through Christ, he knows the man of God. He's going to be a preacher. That's my vision for him right there. He's going to be a preacher someday. I'm telling you. And of course, Money Man Manika, you know, uh, man, he, this guy just, you know, made, made us just convicted us right there with our money, you know. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for a great contribution message over there, bro. Appreciate that one. Let's be up for him. Okay, God, let's turn the Bible to Ephesians chapter 1. Let, let, let's dig on into the word. Ephesians 1, we learned something over here. Okay, for anyone who's confused. Actually, Ephesians chapter 2, not 1. Ephesians 1 is good too. You can read that after church service. But today we're going to read Ephesians 2. You guys say amen when you guys are there. All right, Ephesians 2, we read in verse 14. It says this, For he himself is our peace. Who has made two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility? You know, this says that the only way you can truly have peace today is through Jesus. You know, Isaiah 44 says this, Isaiah 48, 22, it says there's no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. That says that when you choose to live a life of sin, you're not going to have any peace unless Christ is in your life right there. It says he himself is our peace. And it says he's removed the barrier. You know, you guys, that's something. There was a barrier, all right? In the temple, what would happen was you had a wall that divided in sense. You had what is called the court of women, okay? And you also had the court of the Gentiles and you had the Jews as well. So there was always a division for the women on one side, Gentiles in a different section, and the Jews in a different section. This says that Christ, when he came, he removed the barrier, saying that he wants all nations to be saved. And I love how I look at the church today. I'm like, man, I see we got Sri Lanka in the house. We've got Hong Kong in the house. We have Rwanda in the house. And we got the Dutch in the house right there, guys. Let me tell you something. This says that Christ died for all nations. Not just for the Jews alone. He died for everyone. So if you're here today, Christ died for you. It says something here. It continues. It says, verse 15, By setting aside in his flesh the law with his commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And the church says, Amen. This says that Christ came to bring what is called a new humanity. For a long period in the early days, uh, in about the first century, uh, uh, first century church, when it began, guess what the church was called? The Christians. They were called the third race. That's what they were called. For a while, they were called the third race. For a while, they were called the new race. In a sense, you think, okay, what did God do? Basically, through Christianity, God created a new world order. He created a new world order with one faith, one hope, one Lord, one baptism, one church, and one God. And how did he do this? He did it with individuals who were, in a sense, illuminated with the word of God, and they're called enlightened ones right there. God created a new world order. Amen. Now, some of you guys are saying, Frank, why are you talking about this today? Now, of course, you know, uh, I've lived in London for about five years before moving to Birmingham. 
And now some of you guys may be familiar with, the, you know, uh, a certain individual or individuals rather in London or also in Birmingham. You usually find these individuals in, you know, uh, like a, a Tesco, outside of Tesco or Sainsbury's or outside stations, right? Now they sell a particular magazine, okay? Uh, now this magazine isn't Vogue magazine for all the fashionistas out there. This magazine isn't National Geographic for all the scientists out there. This magazine is an auto car for all the car enthusiasts out there. This magazine isn't even men's health, okay, for all the gym rats out there. But this magazine, right, you know, for a long period, you know, I kind of looked down on it, okay. But then today, I le- uh, not today, but this week, I learned something interesting about this magazine. It actually has quite good charitable causes, okay? You're like, okay, well, what does it do? It, its aim is to, in a sense, end homelessness in the UK. That's its aim. So I'm like, wow, okay, it's pretty interesting. And of course, you know, the title of today's lesson is inspired from this magazine. And this magazine is called The Big Issue. The Big Issue. You know, I then started thinking about what are the big issues in the world? Now, according to the United Nations, they say there are about 18 global issues. So therefore, I got an 18-point sermon for you today. Okay, Leslie, Leslie almost fell away on me right there. She's like, bro, I got my Netflix to watch later on. I'm just playing with you guys. Now remember, God was creating, and God created a new humanity. And when you think about all these world issues, I looked at the list, of course, I read all the, uh, all the different things in the list, and it's kind of sad that God or religion isn't a big issue on the list. Wow. Little do they know that the world's biggest issues were actually solved by Christianity. <laughs> Little do they know that. They're trying, to solve, they're trying to get peace and solve all the issues without God. You ask, okay, how, how did Christianity change the world? Now, of course, some of you guys may be aware of something I shared some time ago, right? In the Greco-Roman era, you have what is called infanticide, okay? And in a sense, you know, uh, child abandonment. What would happen was that during the time it was normal, if you had a baby, particularly a female, if you had a baby, what would happen was that, uh, you know, they'd go to a particular place and they'd throw away the babies. And what Christians would do was they would go to this place, take the babies because they valued life and they raised them as their own. That's what they did. And one other way they did this uh, abandonment was actually quite scary. Another way was they would burn babies or they would drown babies to death. And this practice only ended around 364 AD. But it was, in a sense, uh, ignited by the Christians. Abortion. It was very much acceptable during this time as well. The practice was done to read evidence of sexual immorality and to remain childless as well. Long before Christ came, you had various uh, philosophers such as Aristotle, Plato, and Celsus, who in a sense validated the practice of abortion. Plato said say this, It was the prerogative of the city-state to have a woman submit to an abortion so the state would not become too populous. That's what the f- philosopher said. Human sacrifice, gladiatorial shows, and a general acceptance of glorification of suicide were also common practices. Over time, these were ended because Christians valued life. They said, no, every single human soul is valuable. What else did Christians do? It elevated sexual morality. Not immorality, morality. Christianity, in a sense, ended adultery. Rather, it brought attention to adultery. Fornication, homosexuality, bestiality, and child molestation as well. Because at that time, it was acceptable. What else do Christians do? Women receive their freedom and their dignity. It's quite evident today when you look at some countries that are, in, in a sense, you know, Christian influence. And you see today how they value their women. That's how they value women at that time as well. Women couldn't go to school. Sarah could not get a PhD. She just could not at this time. I'm serious. Without Christianity, Sarah could not get a PhD, right? Women couldn't speak in public. You had no sense of encouragement, literally. Not just, women couldn't speak in public. Women couldn't speak to men. If it wasn't for Christ, no kingdom days, guys. That's how serious it was. And when Christ came and Christianity began, it literally elevated women. It gave women a name, it gave women an identity, and it allowed women to speak at home as well. Amen. How else did Christianity change the world? It changed the world through charity. Came for the poor. 
employee-employer relationships, liberty and justice, and guess what? Education as well. The top universities in the world were founded by Christians. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Cambridge, Oxford, University of Edinburgh were all founded by men who believed in God. Christianity began education. Slavery was opposed. It took courage for you to oppose slavery during this time. Paul tried it. This is why when you read scriptures, in a, when people read the Bible, said they read it from a, 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 the wrong point of view. Slavery was a huge money-making system. Christianity, the Christians were being flogged and impaled on stakes for believing in Jesus already. For Paul to preach a message that said, hey guys, we're going to end all slavery, they're going to get persecuted for slavery as well. So Paul's like, hey guys, we don't want unnecessary persecution, so therefore, let slavery exist, but we're going to put some Christian principles in those relationships. So Paul, in a sense, kind of ended slavery. And when you think about the, the America and England, of course, Abraham Lincoln as well, he ended slavery in America. Now, of course, he wasn't really Christian, but he was raised in a Christian home. He was influenced by Christian values. In England, you had a man called William Wilberforce, right? He was a, a Christian guy. And through him believing in Christ, he said, no, we've got to end Christianity as well in England. You see, Christianity is not a white man's religion. It's an all-man religion. It's an all-man religion. See, we got to stress something, guys, that the biggest issues in this world can be solved through Christianity. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 9. You guys with me, right? The title is simply the big issue. 2 Kings chapter 9. We read here in verse 1. It says, The prophet Elisha summoned a man from the company of the prophets and said to him, Tuck your cloak into your belt. (laughs) Take this flask of olive oil with you and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you get there, look for Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Go to him, get him away from his companions, and take him to an inner room. You know, here it says, Elisha, of course, comes to, he takes one of the company of prophets, one of the men, and he says, okay, bro, tuck your belt, tuck your cloak into your belt. Other translations are awesome. It says, get ready to travel. So he, he goes, he's like, hey, you better get ready to travel. And the question I have for you today is, are you ready to travel? Yeah. Are you ready to travel? Yeah. Are you ready to go anywhere, give up everything, and go where God calls you to go? Yeah. You see, we want to go, to, we want to evangelize the world, but sadly, we don't want to go to the ends of the earth. Yeah. Let alone the end of our street. <laughs> where do you, we say, Frank, okay, what do you mean we got to travel? We got to travel to Paris, guys. Yeah. We got to travel to Paris this year, guys. We gotta go to the EMC, guys, okay? We have to go to the European Missions Conference. This is big, guys. This is the first time ever since the London church began that the EMC is outside of London. Yeah. It's in Paris. Now, it's awesome because the, the hotel where they're meeting, surprisingly, is so historical because the ICRC, years ago when the church was flourishing at that time, they used to meet there as well for a church service. Yeah. So it's awesome to see how God's like, no, no, I'm going to start all over again with the ICC in Paris for the European Missions Conference. We got to go. Yes. We got to go. This, this whole church got to go. Okay? We, we got to make things happen. We got to be ready to travel right there, guys. But now it's interesting, of course, now over here, tuck your cloak into your belt. Now, it, it's this phrase in the Hebrew, okay, uh, sometimes it'd be called bind up your loins, okay? And in, in, a, in a man-to-man kind of sense, it, it would mean to man up as well. So when someone told you, in a, tuck your cloak into your belt, they said, man up. It's time to travel. Because at this time, you're going to stand that, you know, people didn't wear, you know, like trousers like us today. You know, like, you know, we see Ebenezer with his nice suits. You know, we got Christine with the nice trousers. We got boots with the jeans. Now, it was different. At that time, you know, you'd wear long flowing tunics. Right, so it's very nice and breezy and so forth. But now, before you went to battle, you couldn't go to battle with a huge dress. You know, it was kind of challenging. 
So what would happen is to get yourself ready for travel and for battle, they'll tell you, uh, um, in a sense, yeah, bind up your loins. So what would happen is you, you take your dress, right? And then, you know, you, you lift it up, okay? You, you tuck it up in, in your belt, and you, you roll it around, you put, make it like a napkin right there, and then you wear some shorts, okay? So they wore some shorts, guys, in, in the Old Testament, basically. That's how they wore shorts right there. And, and it, it made you free to move around. And it made you ready for battle because it was a sign of showing that the battle is hard. And for you to survive the battle, you got to man up. For the sisters, woman up right there. We need to get ready for battle because it's hard. Ministry is hard. And I've taught this before. Christianity is hard. (laughs) You think, man, my life outside the church is going to be easy. No, no, it's going to be hard. (laughs) Right? Staying single in the kingdom is hard. (laughs) Being a single mom in the world is hard. It's hard, guys. I'm telling you. Being pure in the kingdom is hard. It's quite hard. Going out to your sexual desires and living with disease for the rest of your life in the world is hard too. Like I said before, you got to pick your heart. you got to pick your heart. Christianity is hard. It is hard. But let's keep on going here. What's happening over here? Why are, we, why are we in 2 Kings chapter 9 out of all books in the Bible, okay? Verse 3, it says this. Now remember, he, he's going to Jehu to anoint him, right? Verse 3, it says... Then take the flask and pour the oil on his head and declare, this is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and run, don't delay. <laughs> I hope you guys don't share your faith like that. Come to church and you run up. Don't share your faith like that. Verse 4 says, So the young prophet went to Ramoth Gilead. When he arrived, he found the army officers sitting together. I have a message for you, commander, he said. For which of us? asked Jehu. <laughs> for you, commander, he replied. Jehu got up, went to the house, then the prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anoint you king over the Lord's people, Israel. You will destroy the house of Ahab, your master, and I will avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets and the blood of all the Lord's servants, uh, shared by Jezebel. The whole house of Ahab will perish. I will cut off from Ahab every lost male in Israel, slave or free. I'll make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nabat, and like the house of Basha, son of Ahijah. As for Jezebel, dogs will devour her on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and no one will bury her. Then he opened the door and he ran. (laughs) It's like, man, imagine that happens to you, bro. Verse 11. When Jehu went out to his fellow officers, one of them asked him, is everything all right? Why does maniac come to you? You know the man and the sort of things he says. Jehu replied, that's not true. They said, tell us. Jehu said, here's what he told me. This is what the Lord says. I anoint you king over Israel. They quickly took their clothes and spread them under him on the bare steps. Then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. Interesting story, right? Here we got a couple of issues, guys. We got a few issues over here. And the first one brings you to my first point. It's time to reinvent yourself. It's time to reinvent yourself. So what's going on over here? We see that Elisha sends this young prophet to go and anoint Jehu as king. But guess what? Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 9. 19 rather. 1 Kings 19. We are a Bible church for all those who are visiting today and wondering what's going on. Okay, we are a Bible church. In 1 Kings 19, look at this. Verse 15 says this. The Lord said to him, this is Elijah, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king of Aram, also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mehala to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of uh, Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. So what's going on over here? Wait a minute. Did he get anointed twice? Yeah, he did. He did. Here in 1 Kings 19, he gets anointed by Elijah. And then in 2 Kings 9, we just read, he got anointed by Elisha. So the time and the date between these two periods is about 850 BC in 1 Kings 19. And it's about, in 2 Kings 9, it's 840 BC. For, for 10 years, Jehu knew that he was king. 
But what identity did he go by? An army commander. Let's go back to 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings chapter 9. Look at this. Look at this. So for 10 years, Jehu knew. It was like, man, God's called me. God's called me. He knew it. But he remained as an army commander. Right? Now in 2 Kings 9, what, what, what really happens over here? Now understand, the word anoint in the Hebrew means to set apart. You see, we've been set apart. If you're a disciple today, you've been set apart. When did it happen? When you got baptized. The day you got baptized was the day that God chose you and he set you apart from everyone else in the world. That's, that was your first anointing. But sometimes as a disciple, you need something called a second anointing. <laughs> you need, in a sense, a change. You look at Jehu. You're like, why is a second anointing important? Jehu was known as, he went from army commander to his second anointing to Jehu, the king. His second anointing changed everything. Changed his purpose, changed his title, changed his role. When I think about that, I'm like, wow, what is your name in the kingdom? What is your name in the kingdom? What is the narrative about you in the church? What do people say about you? You know what it is. You know what everyone is saying. The name that everyone's saying about you. Is the name Kate, who's always late? Is that your name? Kate, who's always late? Is the name Tokalot Scott? Is that your name? Tokalot Scott? You know, the Bible says that when words of many sin isn't absent. So when someone talks a lot, I'm like, okay, he's hiding some sin. <laughs> Tokalot Scott, is that your name? Are you stay the same Jane? Is that who you are? Stay the same Jane. Not this Jane. She's different. She got baptized, guys. She's different. Our Jane's different. Our Jane is different. She's a teen. She loves Jesus. She's awesome. She's beautiful. She loves the Lord. She's great. Take her on dates, guys, okay? Amen. What's your name? Are you Violet who needs to diet? Is that who you are? Violet who needs to diet. Is that your name? Are you Ruth who needs some fruit? Is that who you are? What's the name, guys? I'm serious. You know, this, now I, I preach this because I, this is the lesson I had to learn for myself. You know, I, I've, I've been discipled by my amazing father in the faith, Michael Williamson. You know, and uh, you know, as he teaches how you know Kip disciples him with the blowtorch, I get that kind of discipling as well, some blowtorch discipling. Okay, and you know, uh, for for a long period of time, you know, over the course of time, my, my one of my weaknesses is idolatry. That's that's my weakness, right? You know, some of you guys be like, Frank, I can't change. I got a weakness. Don't worry, your weakness can be turned to a strength. It can. So for a long period, for me, my, my, my struggle is idolatry. I, I can tend to idolize things very quickly, you know, uh, because I grew up with not having much, right? You know, so some of the things I idolized for a long period, which I didn't know as a disciple, was money. <laughs> okay, I idolized money. I had no idea. It came years down the line when God came into the ministry and I said no. <laughs> because I, I loved money. I wanted to make money. That's what I wanted to do, right? And some of you guys don't want to go into ministry because of that as well. It's, it's simply because you idolize money. Now, this idol, I didn't know it straight away when I got baptized. I didn't know it even a year later, two years later, three years later. I knew it a couple of years later down the line. So that idol got revealed in my life, and I smashed it right there, amen? So it, it became a strength. Now, that wasn't the only idol that got revealed in my life, <laughs> okay? There was a lot of idol, idols as well that got revealed over the course of time as a disciple in the movement of God. You know, what kind of idols you, you, you're saying? Well, the idolatry of baptisms, right? You know, as a church leader, sometimes you can idolize fruit, okay? Uh, the idolatry of dating, right? You know, I've idolized that one a lot of times. You know, and sometimes I get discipled on a lot of these things. And, you know, uh, I, I got tempted to be discouraged, okay? I was like, man, there's no way I would... I want to change, no way, right? But then the fact that I was able to overcome one of those idols, I was like, okay, I got the faith to smash the rest of my idols as well, amen? So you know what your weakness is. You know what the narrative is about you in the kingdom. It's going to change. You know, Jesus says that when he's coming back, he's going to have some signs of him coming back. Right, some signs. He calls his birth pains, right? Uh, and uh, he says he signs. You know, he's like, when he's coming back, there's gonna be some false teachers, okay? When he's coming back, there's gonna be some earthquakes, 
all right, some natural disasters as well. I believe that if this, I'm serious, guys. I believe that if this system consistently comes early, right? I'm not lying to you. If this system can come early consistently, I believe Jesus Christ is coming back. I'm being dead serious, guys, right? I'm not going to say any names, but Lynette knows who I'm talking about. I'm not going to say any names. I'm telling you, man. If that sister can come early, all the, man, Jesus is coming back. I got I to gotta confess all my sins. She's my best friend, okay? So I, I, I can do that. Brothers don't do that, okay? You can change, guys, okay? I love it, that, guys. She knows. We're best friends, guys, okay? We're best friends. She knows I can tease like that. She's awesome. She's an engineer, guys, at Rolls Royce. That's who she is, all right? So she's trying to fix planes and stuff like that. That's why, you know, the time, time can, you know, you can lose time when you're trying to fix some planes right there, guys, okay? You can lose some time, all right? She's a very smart woman. Top 10 in data. Yeah. Top 10 in the UK, all right? That's who we have in our church, guys, okay? So, yes, all right? Give it up for her. She's awesome. Okay, she can handle the shot over there. Okay, she can handle it. But you, you can change. You can reinvent yourself. Sisters, you can learn to be very encouraging. Believe it or not. You know, there used to be a, a thing in the kingdom when I, when, I, when I first got baptized, right? So, you know, we'd go on kingdom dates, right? Now, what's interesting, a kingdom date for all those who are visiting is us in the church, we believe in being friends with one another, okay? We don't believe in being strangers who come to church, clock in and clock out, no one knows about your life, right? We believe in being friends and being family. So, you know, on a Sunday, what would happen is, you know, my, uh, this is back when I, when I first got baptized, you know, we see brothers, you know, like having some food on a Sunday service, right? Or some, some cookies, you know? I was like, man, so I go to a brother, I'm like, bro, who, who made that for you? He's like, bro, a sister made it for me. I'm like, man, Okay, how do I get some food like that? Go on a date. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. Okay, so I go around. I'm like, bro, you got some cookies. He's like, yeah, bro. I got, who, who made these cookies for you? That sister. Wow. How do I get these cookies? Go on a date. I'm like, man, this is awesome. So I go around. I go around. I'm like, oh, bro, that car looks amazing, bro. Is that from your interest, bro? It's like, no, nah, not really, man. It's just my sister saying thank you. I'm like, man. So I look around the fellowship. I'm like, I want some cookies as well. <laughs> hey, sis, want to go on a date next week right there? I'm serious. That, that was the norm. Every single time when a sister was encouraging a date the day before, the next day, she, she would bring something for the brother. It was a standard in the kingdom of God, right? And, you know, I, I believe the big issue we have here is that that's not been happening quite often. And I think this is something that needs to be brought back into the kingdom here in Birmingham. I'm telling you guys, if you bring some cookies for a brother, whether he's on a diet or not, he's, he's going to be fired up. I'm being dead serious. He's going to appreciate it. You know, we've got to learn. As sisters, you got to learn to appreciate a brother asking on a date. It doesn't matter if the date was bad. It was good. you got to appreciate the brother taking on a date right there. We're going to get some cookies and some food for brothers after dates. Amen? Okay, only like five sisters agreed on that one, okay? That's why we have this sermon. That's why we got this sermon. You, got, you need a second anointing. A second anointing. Right? What do we learn over here as well? We learn a few things. In verse 11, Jehu comes out and they ask him, what, what happened, bro? And of course, he says, you know, you know, the man and the sort of things he says. Another big issue we have is secret Christians. Whoa. Secret Christians. That's, that's another big issue we have. Jehu over here just got anointed as a king. And he comes out of this room, right? And I'll, hey, bro, what happened in there? Nah, sh- nothing happened, bro. They're like, bro. <laughs> We can see the oil on your head, bro. Are you, are you serious right now? In modern day, bro, I saw your baptism photo last week, bro, okay? I saw your baptisms, okay? I know what happened, all right? And he tried to hide his Christianity. And like, wow. You know, it's kind of interesting, you know, like um, early in the week, you know, uh, I believe it was like, yeah, uh, last week, you know, of course I was at the gym. And, you know, this guy, of course, he has a chat with me. We, we go back and forth, we have a talk. And I'm like, hey, dude, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a preacher. He's like, no way. You're a preacher? I'm like, yeah, I'm a preacher. You should come to my church, right? He's from Somalia, basically, right? And he's Muslim, right? But I said, yeah, come to my church, right? So he, he, was, he was the guy who came earlier on today, basically. He was like, hey, guys, I got to go and so forth, right? So that's the guy. We, we, we had a Muslim from Somalia for the first time in Birmingham. Wow. Come to church. That's, of course, yeah, nothing crazy happened, but it's like, wow, he actually came and a seed was planted in his heart. You never know what God's going to do. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 that uh, what we do is we just plant the seed and God makes it all work. You never know. He could come back and be the, the first disciple we have who's Somalian in the movement of God. Come on, let's do 
Question is, do people know that you are a disciple? Do people know that? Do they actually know that they can come to you to be saved? I'm not talking about, you know, you no. do they know that you are the person in my school, in my workplace, on, on my Facebook right now, I can message this sister to learn how to be saved? Do they know that? You see, that's a big issue we have today. People are secret Christians. You know, we, we've got to learn to let our light shine in this world, guys. The world is dark. And, God, you know, the Bible says you've got to let your light shine. I have a challenge for you, very simple challenge. You get a post on your social media, right, this week, that you're a disciple, you know the truth, and you're inviting someone to study the Bible with you. Let the world know that they can come to you to be saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. You got to take that challenge, guys? Yeah. Okay, there we go. That's awesome. Okay, verse 14. Let's, let's keep on going. Verse 14, it says something over here. It says, So Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Now Joram and all Israel had been defending Ramoth Gilead against Haziel, king of Aram, but King Joram had returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds the Arameans had inflicted on him in the battle with Haziel, king of Aram. Jehu said, If you desire to make me king, don't let anyone slip out of the city to go and tell the news to Jezreel. Then he got into his chariot and rode to Jezreel because Joram was resting there and Haziah, king of Judah, had gone down to see him. When the lookout standing on the tower in Jezreel saw Jehu's troop approaching, he called out, I see some troops coming. Get a horseman, Joram ordered, send him to meet them and ask, do you come in peace? The horseman rode off to meet Jehu and said, this is what the king says, do you come in peace? What do you have in peace? Jehu replied, fall in behind me. The lookout reported, the messenger has reached him, but he isn't coming back. He converted him right there. Verse 19, so the king sent out a second horseman. When he came to him, he said, this is what the king says, do you come in peace? Jehu replied, what do you have to do with peace? Fall in behind me. The lookout reported, he has reached him, but he isn't coming back in either. The driving is like that of Jehu, son of Nimshi. He drives like a maniac. This guy was so, his personality can be seen from a mile away. Is that you? People can see your personality from a mile away. So whoop, there it is. There's a joyful sister. Oh, there he is. There's a faithful brother. There he is. So Jehu had a personality that everyone knew about him. There's, like, there's a way he's driving. That's, that's, he's, a, he's a maniac. He drives like a maniac. Verse 21. Hitch up my chariot, Jerem ordered. And when he was hitched up, Jerem king of Israel and Haziah king of Judah rode out, each on his own chariot to meet Jehu. They met him at the plot of ground that had belonged to Naboth, the Jezreelite. We'll talk about that very soon. When Jerem saw Jehu, he asked, Have you come in peace, Jehu? How can there be peace? Jehu replied. As long as this, all the idolatry and witchcraft of your mother Jezebel abound. Second point is simply, if God isn't the priority, it's probably idolatry. If God isn't the priority, it's probably idolatry. You know, Jehu over here addresses another big issue. And I think this is a big issue we have as well today. Idolatry and witchcraft. Now, over here, it talks about this guy called Naboth, right? Now, when you study out the first kings, Naboth, what Naboth had was he had, a, he had a vineyard, a fruitful vineyard. Okay, he had a garden which was made out of fruit. And then what happened was Ahab and Jezebel, it says out of envy. Ahab was envious. He killed Naboth and he, he took his, his vineyard and he turned to a vegetable garden. And you're like, wow, is that how far envy can take you? You see, we never think envy is very evil. The Bible says that envy is what killed Jesus. It says it was out of envy that they handed him over to Pilate. Envy actually killed Jesus. It wasn't, you know, anything. It was just, I'm envious of this person. You see, envy can really kill us, guys. And it can take us farther than we think. So they, here, they kill this guy called Naboth. But Jehu was like, how can there be peace as long as there's idolatry and witchcraft in this nation? When you look at this and study it out, the word peace in the Hebrew is shalom. Okay, it's shalom. It means a completeness of welfare. To make amends or to make whole. And peace at this time is often used in terms of making restitution, right? It can therefore mean a state of wholeness, completeness, 
without any deficiency or lack. So when you lack something, you have no peace. In a sense, that's what happens. When you're lacking, you have no peace. Now, Jehu's name is the Lord is Jehovah. And as Jehu is traveling, everyone keeps saying, do you come in peace? He's like, what do you have to do in peace? Fall in behind me. That was a military term, meaning join my rank. So the only way there could be peace in this nation was if everyone fell in behind God. Jehu was like, just fall in behind me, bro. All you got to do, the only way we can have peace in this nation is if every person falls in behind and follows God, Jehovah. That's Jehu right there. And I, I look at this, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Everyone desired peace. And wasn't it amazing that, we, you know, we live in a time where there's what is called the religion of peace, Islam. And Dia was like, you know what? I didn't find any peace in that religion. She changed. She saw Jesus. She met Jesus through the scriptures. She became a disciple. She got baptized last week right there. And she, she's at peace. She's awesome. She's at peace. You know, true peace can only come through Christ. Idolatry was the issue over here. Idolatry was the issue. What is really idolatry? Right? You, some of you guys are wondering what idolatry really is. There's a man by the name Tim Keller. He described idolatry in a book called Counterfeit, uh, Counterfeit Gods as this. Anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything that you seek to give you what only God can give you. What are some examples of idolatry today? Family. You can idolize a family. Romantic relationships. Sex. Some people right now don't want to become disciples because of a relationship. Because of sex. That's the reality. We can idolize that. We can idolize jobs. We can idolize pleasure. We can idolize our, 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 our stomach. Do you know that, guys? I'm serious. Food. Some people idolize food. It says in Philippe, it says that some people make God their stomach. That's what it says in the Bible. Some people, they're, literally, their God is their stomach. Food. They turn to food for comfort. You can idolize intellect. We can idolize intellect. Right? You can idolize as well comfort. Yeah. These are some things we can idolize today. Idolatry is anything that literally, in a sense, can shape your thinking, can alter your emotions, and to some extent, it can even steal your devotion. That's how you know you have an idol in your life. Now, of course, I shared all my idols before. What's your idol today? What's your idol? What is something in your life right now that you're not putting above God? If God isn't the priority, it's probably idolatry. Yeah. It's idolatry. It's idolatry. Let's read. Let's carry on reading verse 30. Bring it for a close. It says, the last point is simply, trust is broken when lust is open. Trust is broken when lust is open. Verse 30. Then Jehu went to Jezreel. When Jezebel heard about it, she put on some makeup, arranged her hair, and she looked out of a window. As Jehu entered the gate, she asked, Have you come in peace, you Zimri, you murderer of your master? What do we learn over here? Of course, Jezebel, now her, her husband just died. And straight away, she's offering herself in a flirtatious way. She's like, okay, let me try and let me, let, me, let me get Jehu to lust over me. Perhaps that's how I can win him over. But Jehu, of course, and she's, she calls him Zimri. Now, who is Zimri? Zimri is by far, he holds what is called the record of the shortest reigning king in the whole entire Bible. How long did he last? Seven days. She said, you are Zimri. You can only last seven days as a king. Modern day, you can only last seven days in the kingdom. That's, how long do you plan to last long in the kingdom, guys? I gotta ask you that question. How long? How long do you want to be in the kingdom? One week? Do you want to be a Zimri? You know, you gotta say something over here. Jezebel, of course, she was trying to 
she's trying to get this guy to come out of the kingdom. It's like, Jehu, let me try and get you out of your kingship. Let me get you, let me get you out of your discipleship. You know, through lust. Now, Jezebel is interesting. Her name means to ex- uh, not exalted. <laughs> and she tried to exalt herself so much when you, when, you, when you study her out. And so many women today, sadly, they refer to Jezebel as, a, as the, the, they say, the first female feminist, in a sense. Wow. Feminism was, I'm being serious. Feminism was, in a sense, inspired by Jezebel. Because she was, you know, when you study out the scriptures, Jezebel was the one who led her husband. Right? Ahab was just, you know, hey, you know, all sully and, and, you know, and, you know, bitter every time. She was one who, in a sense, killed Naboth. She, she brought idolatry in the nation. She brought witchcraft in the nation. So she, she led. So they see her as a, a figure of leadership. See, God was like, Jezebel, your name is not exalted. Stop exalting yourself. And he humbled her. He humbled her. He humbled her. Now, of course, when you look at this, you're like, man, Jehu could have been like, man, okay, this is my shot, Jezebel. Because she, she was pretty. You could, you could guess that. There's a little transformation. And arranged her hair, oh boy, okay. So, <laughs> Jehu could have looked at her like, oh man, this is my shot. Right? He could have done that. It's like, this is my shot, right? But what do we learn over here, right? We cannot date and marry non-disciples. Yeah. We, that, that is something you, you should not do. You cannot date and marry a non-disciple. Right now, don't be like me, guys. Okay, I, like you know, I've, I've, I've done a lot of mistakes. Okay, as a young Christian, I've shared a lot of my mistakes I've done and so forth. Right, you know, as a young Christian, I, I, I didn't fully have this as a conviction. Right, believe it or not, you know, uh, you know, I would evangelize and share my faith and so forth. You know, with women, um, and you know, one, one, one occasion, you know, of course, I, I spoke to this one sister, you know, and not sister, sorry, this one woman. Um, I suppose there's one woman, you know, I was like, hey, I was like, my name is Frank. It's like, oh, my name is Frankie. I was like, ooh. <laughs> I'm serious. This, this was me. I'm not even lying. This is me two, three weeks as a disciple. I'm being serious. So, me and Frankie start texting. <laughs> and... Um, so, of course, you know, the Holy Spirit is inside of me. It's like, bro, you're in sin. <laughs> so I had to, yeah, it's going to be a Zimri right there. I had to get open with my disciple. I said, like, hey, bro, um, you know, I'm texting this girl. And my disciple gave me the rebuke of my life. And it's like, delete it right now. And he made me delete her number right there on the spot. Literally on the spot. He said, delete, delete her number right now. You know, and I'm like, man. I was like, what? My name is Frankie, you know. <laughs> Frankie. That's, that's, I, I delete, delete Frankie. It's just off my phone. I delete her. You know, we've got we to gotta have convictions here on this. I'm serious, guys. You know, we, we cannot be, you know, messaging our exes. What, what, what's there? You can be messaging your, your ex. Can we think about your ex? You know, no, we can move on. Move on. They, they, they are amazing, beautiful men and beautiful women in the kingdom, right? So, you know, this, this is a handsome man, beautiful women in the kingdom, okay? And uh, let me tell you something. You have this conviction long enough, you become Josh and Jackie right there, okay? You become Josh and Jackie. I'm serious. We've we, we got to have this conviction. You know, just if, if you have any contact with non-disciples that can make you struggle, I, I, I encourage you, cut it off. Cut it off, guys. It, it's not worth it. You don't want to be a Zimri in the kingdom of God. You, you, don't, you don't want a Jezebel. You know, let me tell you something. For every, for, for every Jehu, there's a Jezebel. <laughs> All right? For every Christine, there's a Chris out there. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I, I'm serious. For every Frank, there's a Frankie out there trying to take you out. I'm serious. You gotta be careful, right? There's, there's, there's someone out there, you know, for every Lynette, there's a Lionel somewhere. I don't know what it is. You gotta be careful. You gotta be careful, guys. I'm serious. You gotta cut these things off. They can, you, you could be a Zimri. Lost seven days in the kingdom, okay? But look at this, guys, okay? We bring for a close here. Look at this, okay? It says in 32, I, I, I like these guys. 32 says, he looked up at the window and called out, okay? Um, who is on my side? Who? 
two or three eunuchs look down at him. <laughs> throw her down, Jehu said. So they threw her down, and some of her blood splattered the wall and the horses as they trampled her underfoot. Jehu went in and ate and drank. <laughs> take, take care of that cursed woman, he said, and bury her, for she was a king's daughter. But when they went out to bury her, they found nothing except her skull, her feet, and her hands. That, that's, that's how you should remove, just, just remove it entirely. There should be no trace of it. Yeah. They went back and told Jehu, who said, this, this is the word of the Lord that, that he spoke through his servant Elijah, the Tishbite, on the blood of ground of, Jez, uh, of Jezreel, dogs will devour Jezebel's flesh. Jezebel's body will be like dung on the ground in the blood of Jezreel, so that no one will be able to say, this is Jezebel. I like the eunuchs. I like the eunuchs. The eunuchs, man, they were like they were, they were tired of Jezebel, man. <laughs> they, 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 they're like they, were, they probably just stood there. They looked at each other, like, bro, we gotta throw her down, bro. Let's, <laughs> let's get out of here, man. Let's join the kingdom, right? The eunuchs were individuals, individuals who saw their opportunity. That's what it was. They're like, man, we, this, this woman is sinful. We gotta, we gotta join the men of God. Yeah. We gotta join God's kingdom. The eunuchs saw the opportunity and they took it. And I'm reminded of this phrase, which is what I'm going to close with, basically today. It's by John Stuart Mill. He says this, The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Yeah. You see, the eunuchs here were like, nah, I- I'm going to do something. They-, they didn't allow evil to triumph at this point. They saw the opportunity and said, I'm going to do some good. I'm going to do some good. I'm going to join God's kingdom. You know, and of course, the Bible says, hey, the good you ought to do Right? If, if anyone knows the good ought to do and doesn't do it, it's a sin. <laughs> so there's a lot of good things we can do as disciples. Right? What's the first good thing you can do? You can make a disciple. That's, that's the first good thing you can do. For all those who are part of the church, you just got to make it. That's a good thing to save someone's soul. And for those who are visiting today, you're wondering, okay, what's going on? Let me tell you something. The solution to the world's biggest problems and issues is the Bible. Yeah. It is the Bible. You've come today not by coincidence. God has brought you here today. He's drawn you today to this church for a reason. I encourage you, get into a Bible study with us. Learn what it means to really, in a sense, to be a Christian so you can really find peace, right? Smash that idol and make God your number one priority. I love you and to God be all the glory.